This is Open Line with today's host, Father Brian Malady. In North America, call toll free 1 833 288 EWTN. That's 1 833 288 3986. Outside North America, call 1 205 271 2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. A tremendous Thursday to each and every one of you. The Thursday in the octave of Christmas. Welcome to EWTN's Open Line. Father Brian Milady is in the house ready to answer your questions. Pick up the phone and give us a call at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, we'd still uh, love to entertain your question. That number is one 1- Two zero five two seven one two nine eight five, and we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at one two zero five two seven one two nine eight five. And you can always send us an email. That email address is openline at ewtn.com. I'm Jack Williams, Michael McCall, producing the program. Your call screener is Matt Gubensky and uh, Rich Jesse handling our social media efforts today. So if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can type a question into the chat window and it may find its way to us by the end of the program. And our host, as he is every Thursday, the gallivanting, globe trotting Father Brian Milady. How are you? It's fine. Thank you. Merry Christmas to everyone. Oh, Merry Christmas to you. You've made your way to sunny Southern California. Uh, as you do this time of year to tend to the spiritual needs of a group of Dominican sisters there? Carmelite sisters. Carmelite sisters there. That's what I meant. (laughs) Well, we don't want to get back of the sisters. They were considered Carmelites. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) So uh, so, um, we've just uh, celebrated the feast of um, the... Creator of the universe made incarnate, and you want to talk a little bit about uh, the witness of that today at the beginning of the program. Yes. Uh, yeah, the Octave of Christmas is a very interesting uh, celebrate, uh, liturgical time because first we have the great joy of celebrating the incarnate word from Mary's womb. But as Bishop Sheehan used to say, and uh, Benedict also reflects in his own writings, following the tradition of the church, Jesus is primarily a redeemer. So as Bishop Sheehan used to say, every other man was born on earth to live, Christ was born to die. And the witness to not only the fact that the word made flesh and our redeemer has come among us is in blood, but it's also in um, a non-bloody way. So yesterday, of course, we celebrated St. John, who was the non-bloody way, because, well, for several reasons. First of all, as the entrance Antiphon put it for mass, He rested on the breast of our Lord and had heavenly secrets revealed to him. And we're invited also to rest on the breast of our Lord in the Eucharist and communicate heart to heart, something which is shown in John in the final belief in the risen Jesus, where at the word of Mary Magdalene, he and Peter go to the tomb He runs first because he loves so much, and love goes ahead of knowledge. Both are necessary. And then they saw and believed. Now, the other feasts during this week are all by blood, which are fascinating. First of all, we have the first martyr of the church, St. Stephen the proto-martyr, who is also a Hebrew, a Jew, and who gives witnessed during his trial to having preached in the name of Jesus, a trial which is very unusual, too, in the sense, not so much of what they did to him, 
But the fact that it's a very unusual form of death, because if you remember, they were questioning him and he defeated them all in their arguments from the scriptures, which would be the Old Testament. And then it's that they take him out to stone him. Every single person in, in stoning becomes an executioner in the community. And he looks at heaven and he is witness. He witnesses not only that Jesus is born in a stable in his flesh, but that he is in heaven also in his flesh. Uh, I see heavens open and Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father, Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. And this is too much for them, so they kill him. And he's always used as an example for intercessory prayer because remember Acts very pointedly remarks that they pile up their coats at the foot of a man named Saul who concurred in the act of killing. And yet, when Stephen prays that God will forgive them for what they're doing to him, Many in the Christian tradition believe that was the means God used to convert St. Paul. Then, of course, we have today's feast where people don't say anything when they're even little children, where they're in just out of the womb themselves, and silently they give witness to the incarnate word by dying for him. In this, they shield so that Jesus is a new Moses. Because in Moses' birth, remember, the Pharaoh had the Hebrew children stone, and he even convinced the midwives, the Egyptian midwives, to hide the births of his tyranny. And so we have the massacre of the innocents with the tyrant Herod, who has all the firstborn killed in the Bethlehem region, in the Nazareth Bethlehem region. And yet, this leads Jesus to flee into Egypt and supposedly get what wisdom and knowledge from the Egyptians. And also, uh, it allows um, the innocence to show the depth and power of the word made flesh's ability to redeem because they're redeemed by their own blood. And so we have the massacre of the innocents. And then finally, I always like to talk about tomorrow because it's my feast day where we have another martyrdom, this time in the name of the church as the body of Christ. Instead of seeing the church as just an organ of the state where its laws can be um, manipulated to the use of wicked monarchs, Thomas Beckett is murdered in a Christian era by Christians, Christian knights, at the behest of a Christian king on the altar in the cathedral. And he's also the primate, the Archbishop of Canterbury of England. Of England. This in itself was a horrid crime when it was made it had been done in the Middle Ages. And in fact, as you know, the shrine of Thomas Beckett was the second shrine in Christendom of pilgrimage to St. James of Compostela. So the woman was an apostle, but Thomas Beckett's murder was so notorious that they actually sent parts of the body as relics around the world. And we managed to recover one because Henry VIII basically had all the relics burned in England but it turns out there was one in another place in Europe that was recently restored to England. And not only did the Catholics come, but oddly enough, the Anglicans came too to receive this relic. So here we have a final witness of a bishop in a Catholic country in the church with a Christian king who also by his blood is witness to the word of God, in this case, our Lord in the Holy Catholic Church. We should thank God for all these witnesses because they're also diverse for one thing, and they helped to uh, expand and flesh out the feast 
so we realize it's not it's not just Santa and toys and you know sugar plum fairies and all that those, those are okay you know there's nothing wrong with them but here we have blood immediately of martyrdom because martyr means witness we have the blood of martyrs that testify to the word made flesh i think a good way to end my little meditation is with the old latin hymn for the feast of holy innocence O Herod, wicked of all life, fear that Christ the Lord approaches near. He does not take your earthly sway, whom heavenly kingdoms gives away. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Mullady. Join Archbishop Jose Gomez in sharing the good news. The war? The Holy Family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph was just another family. It was such a typical family that when Jesus began his ministry, people were kind of skeptical. They said, isn't this the carpenter's son? They were simple people or everybody else. But God called them to play an extraordinary part in his plan of salvation. It's the same with each one of us. And we do that, participating in God's plan of salvation, by living our own faith, following the commands of God in our ordinary daily lives, especially in our families. And as we enter this new year, and let us ask the intercession of Mary, our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph, to renew our desire to do the will of God in our daily life. Visit LACatholics.org to find ways to connect with our faith community in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Today marks the 31st anniversary of the launch of EWTN Radio. From the early days of WEWN shortwave to the addition of AM and FM stations, satellite radio, web streaming, and smart speakers, we've never wavered from our mandate to proclaim the truth and majesty of the Catholic faith. Thank you for joining EWTN in this mission. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. You know, EWTN's religious catalog has more Christmas items on sale. Uh, it's a great time to get ready for next year, and a great item here uh, featured today. For those of you who hate to gift wrap, uh, we have a Be Still and Know That I Am God gift bag. includes uh, tissue paper to neatly uh, arrange a gift that would go in that bag. And these lovely gift bags come, as I said, with the tissue paper, making it easier to prepare for next year. The front and back reads, Be Still and Know That I Am God, Psalm 46, verse 10. Gold foiling enhances the script, and gross and uh, and the and a grain ribbon handle makes it uh, easy to carry. There are many styles from which to choose. You can visit ewtnrc.com to pick your favorites. It's now available at EWTN's religious catalog. They're offering free standard shipping on online orders of seventy five dollars or more. That is standard shipping in the continental U S. Only use the code free at checkout. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Grab one of these open phone lines at 833-288-3986. First up is Jeff in Riverside, Illinois, uh, listening on Roku today. Jeff, you're on with Father Brian Mullady. Hey, hello, Jack and Father Brian. Merry Christmas to you both. Thank you so much for taking my call. I have a uh, question and then um, a request for Father Brian. My question is about the Roman canon. There's a portion of it that I've always found a little bit confusing, and I was hoping Father Brian could uh, clarify it. Uh, It's the portion where the priest says, um, Remember, Lord, your servants and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them. It's the the option there. We offer it, 
view the sacrifice of praise or they offer it for themselves that I've always found a little bit confusing. Um, and then I do, do have a request as well. Uh, it's my wife's birthday today, and it's kind of tough to have a birthday on the Feast of the Holy Innocents. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you could include her at the end of the program in your, uh, I mean, obviously she'd be included in your blessing of all the listeners, but I'm just wondering if you could just, um, just remember her especially because it is a challenge uh, for her every year when she hears the, um, the gospel today. Well, tell her how she has a special blessing for me and our Lord to appreciate her life as a witness, too, in addition to the martyr of the innocents who gave their life for Christ. Uh, I would assume that you offer, you know, you have an oblation yourself. It's not the same as the priest oblation, but as you remember, uh, and the same is true, the Arate Fratres, pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Because a part of what you do at Mass is an oblation as well, in which you participate in the offering of Jesus um, in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Jeff, what's your wife's first name? Michelle. Awesome. Thanks so much for the phone call today, and Merry Christmas to you as well. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Dale is in the great state of Minnesota, a first-time caller listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Dale, you're on with Father Brian Mullady. Thank you, gentlemen, for taking my call, Father. Uh, Just a quick question. Is there anything in the Bible where evangelicals uh, get this once saved, always saved? Do you know where they get that from, or is that no? That's that's a thing. That's that's Martin Luther. That's the result of the idea that grace is an imputation. In other words, it's a psychological change, not an ontological change. We consider ourselves now as Christians to be justified, but we're really still all miserable sinners. In other words, it's all in our mind. And how do you make it more or less in your mind or never in your mind anymore? Once you're convinced that Jesus is your personal savior, then basically you can do whatever you want. And that's why you're always saved. So they have no sacrament of confession as a result. And uh, with us, uh, a member of the Catholic response, uh, uh, we always say, is, is also whether you can know you're in the state of grace or not. Protestants believe they can because, of course, it's an invitation. They just decided that Jesus was their savior. So they said, know that, obviously. And um, on the other hand, our answer has to be Joan of Arc's because when she was asked if she was in the state of grace, uh, because it's heretical to maintain that you can know you're in the state of grace, and had she said she did know, she would have committed heresy because only God really knows about this state since he causes it. And if she said no, they would have burned her as a witch. So her response was what the Catholic response is. If I'm not, may God put me there. And if I am, may God keep me there. God bless you, Dale. Merry Christmas. Thanks so much for the phone call today. That opens up a line for you at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Pick up the phone and give us a call with your question for Father Brian Mullady. Uh Michael writes in, in the New Testament, Jesus and the apostles are constantly casting out demons and performing exorcisms, but you hardly hear about that happening today. Does it still happen? Yes, but it is not as necessary. Remember, in those times, 
Jesus was confronting the demons or the apostles at his behest. And they were, this is the first time anybody had ever confronted them in their kind of lordship over the earth. And they were very, very difficult because of this. And the exorcisms had to be many. Although it's interesting when Christ decides not to perform an exorcism, as in the desert when he's tempted by Satan. Remember, he could have performed an exorcism, but he didn't because he wanted to teach us that we need not fear the devil as long as Christ is on our side. Now, today, we're so used to having the gospel preached and many people believing in it that it, it, it's kind of like all the miracles in the Acts of the Apostles. The miracles, remember, are given for a reason. They're given to support a teaching. And when the gospel has been believed in by so many people in so many different places, those kind of miracles aren't necessary today. In a similar way, now that the demons have been confronted, it's not exactly necessary to confront them in that formal way in which Christ confronted them, as he did in the Gerasene demoniac or whatever. Also, we certain things that were attributed to demons may have been at their behest, but since they have less power, they have less influence, and were brought more back to natural causes. So medicine, for instance, some diseases that may have been due to the influence of the demons. Once their influence becomes less, then we can use medical science to try to cure those. 833-288-EWTN. That's our phone number, 833-288-3986. We head now to Indianapolis, Indiana. Anne is listening on Catholic Radio Indy. And Merry Christmas. Uh, you are on with Father Brian Milady. Uh Merry Christmas. Thank you very much. My question today is um, I'm going to be attending a, uh, a Russian Orthodox uh, funeral mass, and I was wondering if it's okay for me to take communion. Well, you can as far as we're concerned, but the Russians might not take it too kindly. <laughs> As you know, the Eastern churches, especially Moscow, have always been much more against us than we are against them. We've all recognized the other sacraments, but the question is, at least we recognize theirs. The Greeks recognize our sacraments, but they don't like us. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, as far as we're concerned, you can take the sacrament there. But the question is, um, if they're going to be quite as uh, open-minded, let's put it that way. Does that help, Ann? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thanks so much for the phone call. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Um, Ed wants to know if God has one mind and one consciousness, or does he have three? There's only um Let's see now. My Trinitarian theology. Okay, there's three persons, so there would be three... Um, the divine truth is shared by all three and the same with the love it's why even though we attribute truth to the son all three of the persons are true all three of them are loving but as radically um relating beings they have a division that's the only division remember in the trinity is in relationship of origin. So the father uh, communicates the being, the son 
reflects it, and the Holy Spirit is the union between the two. So I would say there's only one consciousness and one truth. But as to, of course, there's no consciousness really in the Trinity. His consciousness assumes, um, like uh, imagination and things like that, and, uh, and different minds, that sort of thing. To have that, you'd have to have sensual experience in this case of us, or in the case of the angels, you'd have to have an intellect. Um, Eight. Different yep. intellects. Very good. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. It's Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Mullady. WGN Real News Minute is next. The year 374 AD. Monica, mother of St. Augustine, is a pious Christian woman from North Africa. Although she strives to instill Christian values in her son, the young Augustine slowly distances himself from the light of Christianity and enters the dark world of Manichaeism. His wayward behavior hurts Monica deeply. In tears, she prays day and night for the conversion of her lost son. When Augustine travels to Italy after finishing his studies, Monica follows him to Rome and later to Milan to prevent him from falling deeper into sin. In Milan, Augustine meets Bishop Ambrose and is amazed by his sermons. He formally converts to Christianity in 386 AD after reading the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. December is the month dedicated to the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We're invited to meditate on the virtue of purity. Join us in this devotion to the Immaculate Conception with rosaries, devotional candles, meditations, statues, keychains, and flags available at EWTNRC.com. And get a free Immaculate Conception Novena from us by visiting EWTN.com slash Immaculate Conception. We hope you will pray this beautiful novena with us as we celebrate the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception during December. Hi, this is Cy Kellett. Join us later today on Catholic Answers Live as we do our best to explain and defend the Catholic faith. Catholic Answers Live, 6 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Now back to Take Two with Jerry and Debbie. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. A couple of open lines for you and plenty of time for your calls at 833-288-3986. Next up is Joel. He's in Waterloo, Iowa, listening at EWTN.com. Joel, thanks so much for holding. Welcome to the program. Thank you. I appreciate the call, and I would like to just kind of say that I've thought about how I personally would leave so, lead somebody into the faith, and I thought to start out with that would be to tell them that God loves them. Do you have any more suggestions as far as how to further on to that? Oh, gosh, yes. Uh, God does love them. That's the most important thing. You're right about that. But just the very fact of the Lord is uh, God is the creator of nature. Most people are very impressed by natural beauty, and you know, question the heavens and see God. Uh, the, heaven, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows the Lord for the work of His hands. Day unto day takes up the story, and not into night makes known the message. That text is a prophecy in the Old Testament about the presence of God in creation, and yet it's also used in our liturgy for the witness of the apostles. So you have the witness of the heavens of nature itself, and you have the witness of the apostles. Um, you have all the wonderful things that people do in the church to demonstrate their love. And uh, there's all so many levels on which you could discuss the goodness of the Christian church is true that we've done some evil in the world, mostly the 
political side of the church or us defending the church. But in general, when you consider Christianity in relation to the other religions, there's just no real comparison. And also, if you don't have any, oh, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's the clear in the Bible also. So uh, if Plato and Aristotle could discover God through reason, we can certainly discover God through reason too, and especially by testifying to create, create giving um, witness through nature. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Chris is a first-time caller in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Chris, you're on with Father Brian. Good afternoon. My question is, what is the best form of intercessory prayer? So if I'm saying Mother Mary... Uh, do I say, ask God to protect my children in Jesus' name? Do I say, ask Jesus to watch over my children? What would be the best format? I don't think there really is one, as long as you're praying to Christ. Uh, you can just say, Mother Mary, protect my children. And there's nothing wrong with that, because the only reason she is asked, we're invoking her to protect her children, is because she's the mother of Jesus. So it all comes back to Christ somehow. But um, you can pray to the saints to do that by their names, that sort of thing. Of course, the Lord's is uh, the uh, Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Christ taught us. But that's, um, it's used in catechesis to try to summarize all the different kinds of prayer and how we pray praise God, and we also forgive each other. But it's more like a paradigm of prayer. Uh, there is no one formula. I think oftentimes, probably, tell, correct me if I'm thinking wrongly here, but I think that sometimes if we if we ask for the intercession of a, of a saint that we are particularly devoted to, it probably increases our chances of praying more often if it's some one or some saint that we're interested in. Yes, but you could invoke the prayers of the saints directly. Like, um, Chicago called in and she wants to know why doesn't Catholicism believe in assurance of salvation? Doesn't Paul talk about how he knew he was going to heaven? Oh, um, I'm not aware of any place where St. Paul says, yeah, I know I'm going to heaven. Uh, so I would deny the major. I can, <laughs> Which is not I can think major. of a lot of, uh, I can think of a lot of uh, instances when he kind of said the exact opposite. <laughs> yeah. Um, he talks about the gifts God has given him and the fact that he's destined for heaven. But I'm not aware of any text where he says he's assured of salvation no matter what he does. And I've actually had um, Protestants tell me that even if they commit murder, as long as they accept Jesus as their personal Savior, they, they don't have to worry. They'll go to heaven. And um, you know, I asked one about Matthew 25, you know, I'm hungry, which you gave me to eat. Um, and said, aren't those works? And he said, oh, but those aren't for Christians. That's, that's the white throne of judgment. Christians don't have that kind of a judgment. Uh, we, uh, that's for pagans. So, of course, my response was, well, where do you find that in the Bible? <laughs> but as far as I can tell, there is no place. So, Thanks. You know, it, it, I, it, Luther, as you know, was very tormented by whether he was saved or not. And uh, he used to confess several hours every day. I can't imagine his poor superior, the Augustinian Father Stopitz, to whom, to whom he went to confession, having to sit there and listen to this guy's scruples for, oh gosh, at least an hour every day. I mean, it just boggles belief. So what he basically decided was, well, since uh, I'm so concerned and I've done all these things, it must not be the key to that. The key is I, I must, you know, be saved because I just believe 
that's it. You know. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Wide open phone lines for you on this Thursday at 833-288-3986. Um, email from Rhett. He says, what is the difference between providence and divine providence? Well, it, uh, providence basically means what will happen in the future. And uh, providencia, you know, you provide for things. You see, you have foresight. You have foresight. One would be God's foresight, and the other would be ours. And it's, it's similar to Christ saying that if you observe the signs of nature, you can predict the weather mostly. Well, in a similar way, if you see these following signs. Get set because that means the, you know, the second coming is coming. But uh, it's the difference between what we can know in a certain sense, and what action and the way uh, God knows things. Eight three three two eight eight E W T N. That's our toll free number. Eight three three two eight eight three nine eight six. Um, ben wants to know, what does the church teach about self-defense and defense of others? Uh, the church teaches that provided the means are um, commensurate to the attack. Um, like, for example, if somebody slaps you, would take out a gun and shoot them. But the means are, you know... Uh, it, it, suitable for the attack that it's perfectly possible especially when it comes to your life or the life of others to defend that life even if it means to the point of taking the life of someone else and that's true yourself and it's true of other people too um, Jackie writes in that she has a 15 year old daughter that she's recently found out is sexually active People have been recommending birth control, but Jackie's not comfortable with that answer, and she wants to know how she can discuss abstinence best with her daughter. How old is this person? Fifteen. Oh, well, that's normal. That's puberty. Wow. Everybody has to learn to deal with that, and they have to learn to deal with it by abstinence. Uh, no, no birth control, none of those things. You may use birth control pills if you're not having sex as a means to regulate your period. Uh, some teenage girls do that. I'm not sure how um, medically sound it is on other these, uh, um, planes, but on that particular plane, as long as you're not having sex, you obviously can't conceive. And so uh, you're not violating chastity so you can do that but that being the case only only case the um the best way is abstinence they just have to learn to abstain and i know people find that difficult today i had a woman described to me once after the sexual revolution occurred this would be in the 70s where she went to a rather traditional convent school and she said what was so amusing was they were having priests come in and talk to us about the evils of petting or kissing. And most of the girls in the class had already done it. <laughs> you know? So it was, uh, it, it, was, it was because it's the sexual revolution that caused all this, giving both men and women the idea that at no age necessarily, once puberty had come on, that they could control themselves, that they could abstain. Now, she has to learn how to control herself. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Still time for your calls at 833-288-3986. We had a rather robust discussion on call to communion today about uh, mortal versus venial sins. And Asher would like to know, how are venial sins forgiven during communion, and when exactly does that happen? All right, well, first of all, you have to re realize that venial sins are only sins 
um, they're not uh, full, full sins, you could say. They don't fully participate in the idea of sin. When Thomas Aquinas discusses sin in the Summa, he means mortal sin, not venial sin. Uh, they're only sin in a manner of speaking because they're not fully uh, integrating your mind and your will with God. So any action in which your mind and your will are turned toward God are sufficient for them to be resolved. Um, whereas mortal sins, because they involve the loss of charity, venial sins do not. And normally the way this is put is venial sins make charity more lukewarm, whereas by mortal sin you lose charity. That's why you have to confess before you return to the state of grace. But in venial sin, you're not in, you're, you're already in the state of grace. It's just that it doesn't have as much influence over you. Now, should we therefore be unconcerned about them? No, because they're kind of like a slippery slope that if we basically uh, indulge in actions which are not fully charitable and skirt the bounds of the moral law, the chances are that we become more uh, deadened to the power of the moral law and that we may commit a mortal sin. But again, Council of Trent was clear that a million venial sins don't make a mortal sin. So they're only um, sin in a manner of speaking. If you want the full intellectual broadside, uh, mortal sins are substantially sin. Venial sins are sins secundum quid in Latin, which means only in a certain respect. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. I want to invite you to tune in to Word on Fire Sunday afternoon, 4 p.m. Eastern time on EWTN Radio. Bishop Robert Barron illustrates the truth, beauty, and goodness of Catholicism in his own unique way. That's Sunday afternoon, 4 Eastern, Word on Fire, right here on EWTN Radio. Next up is Pam. She is another first-time caller in northern Kentucky, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Pam, you're on with Father Brian Milady. Hi, good afternoon. I'm just wondering how to lean into God more to trust him when you know he's calling you to um, he's calling you to challenge you and get outside of yourself and lean into him more well he's calling you to cha to challenge you because he wants you to experience love more deeply it's in a similar way to why and hebrews is very clear about this it's a similar right reason that parents chastise their children and of course they used to be able to even physically do so not because they don't love them but because they do um that's why even when parents were allowed or you know spare the rod and spoil the child which is after all a scriptural expression doesn't mean you're abusing your child every time although civilly speaking today when people could both consider it that is because uh, one stripe is enough you know, uh, but um, we don't, uh, the Catholics don't look on physical punishment as something you do to the point of death or to the point of blood or anything like that. That's actually more of a Protestant notion. It's one of the reasons why, and for example, in the British Army, they used to flog people and they flogged them very much to blood. Uh, but um, because he calls you to heaven, he wants you to have a deeper experience of heaven. And it's because of our sins that we need to suffer like he did something ourselves in order for us to become more aware. Now, he, of course, didn't have any egotism, but we do to get rid of that. And uh, even, if you, even if you don't experience suffering from others, I was talking about this this morning. In the religious life, one of the reasons we embrace it is, according to Saint, the Blessed Abbot Anthony, it's um, a martyrdom to your own conscience, which can be very painful for a person who first embraces it. I think for many people to admit they've got an ego 
is very hard for them and a great suffering. Once they, they finally come face to face with what that means, and then you're struggling with it your whole life, um, it, it, it's not, uh, it, it isn't easy. I remember when I uh, was having some difficulties in the religious life, a nun gave me a holy card and it said, a calm sea will never make a sailor. <laughs> because you only really learn the art of sailing, especially sailing ship with sails by wind when it's tested. Many people can sail a ship to a calm lake, but when they have to get out in the ocean, that's quite different. How's that, Pam? Thank you so much. I appreciate your your knowledge and your wisdom, sir. God bless you. Thank you. We will keep you in our prayers. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. We could probably squeeze in another call or two at 833-288-3986. Jay would like to know, to what degree are we as lay Catholics able to criticize clergy? I recently told a friend that I didn't think we were supposed to criticize, especially on a public platform. Well, it depends on the thing that it's about. Uh, if it's about something that involves being a member of the clergy, that's to say teaching and doctrine and things like that, we're not really allowed to do that if what's said is true. On the other hand, if it's about their moral life or let's say, oh, gee, I, I, I don't know, their, their uh, own conversion of life, well, it's not helpful sometimes to do that because you're, the person represents the church and that tends to hold the church in some kind of contempt. You have a, a tendency to cause scandal in, in the church. But if it's just by the person themselves, every one of us receives whatever gifts we've got in earthen vessels and all of us can be subject to criticism. And sometimes I, I would say it's like all criticism. To be really good criticism, it needs to be constructive. If it's just destructive and egotistical, you wouldn't be allowed to do that even to an ordinary person, much less a cleric. But in the case of a cleric, it has to be constructive criticism. Um, Henry wonders, can you explain the difference between holiness and righteousness ontologically? Righteousness refers more to more than just holiness. Holiness is the fact that you're in the state of grace. For example, when we're baptized, we're in the state of grace. Whereas righteousness refers to the fact that as we become more holy and you know, more in love with God, that our faculties themselves, our intellect, our will, and our passions become more integrated with each other and our moral choices. And all three of those faculties are necessary for a complete and human uh, moral choice. So uh, uh, holiness is something that someone can participate in just by being a, a lukewarm Christian. However, the more they grow in holiness, the more they become righteous. And an interesting question from Christopher. He says, how does God view people with mental, problem, mental health problems? He says, because of this, sometimes my faith fluctuates. Well, we don't know. We, we do know that he doesn't hold them responsible for anything they may do, which is a result of their emotional illness. On the other hand, there is a teaching that if you can do something about your emotional illness and you fail to do it, then whatever results from that is something you're responsible for. So let's say you're an alcoholic, which is a kind of mental condition, I suppose. It's also a lack of prayer. And you could go to AA or you could seek help, but you don't. Or you put, put yourself knowingly in a state of intoxication, thinking that, as often alcoholics do, that uh, this time it's not going to be a problem, but it always is a problem. For those things, God would hold us responsible. In other words, for the cause, whatever, however the cause might relate 
to the uh, resulting behavior. If it's not a result of your problem itself, then you don't have to worry. A uh, bipolar person, for example, can be quite destructive, but they can also be medicated. So if you just choose not to take your medication, and I know many bipolar people who do because they don't like the way it makes them feel, um, then you're partially responsible for what you do. If you can take your medication and you do, and still the problem continues, well, then you're not responsible for that because you've done what you can to help you with your difficulty. Ian wonders why God chose to reveal himself slowly over so many years rather than sending a prophet at the beginning who could teach the truth all at once. Okay, well, that's an easy question to answer. Uh, St. Thomas says, that, remember we say in the fullness of time, Christ came to heaven to earth. Well, why is it the fullness of time? Why did he not wait longer? Why did he come earlier? For example, the moment the sin was committed, well, he, his opinion is that if the thing had been resolved right after it was done, people wouldn't recept, receive it because they still thought they could get away with it. In other words, the human race had to be convinced of the fact that it wasn't perfect. And they had to do that by trying and trying and failing every time much as the Enlightenment thought that they could resolve all truth by the human intellect. And we, we actually believe that. We had great optimism about science and things for the whole 19th century. All of a sudden, we hit World War I. The demons present in the solution came forth. And it wasn't a result of technology. So, and the reason it didn't wait longer was because the human race would have despaired. Father, would you leave us with a blessing, especially for Jeff's wife, Michelle, whose birthday falls yeah, on this Michelle. Feast of the Holy Innocents? Now, Michelle, we bless you from the radio, okay? And happy birthday. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, descend upon you and your name forever. Amen. Amen. On behalf of our host, Father Brian Milady, our producer, Michael McCall, call screener Matt Gubensky and our social media maven, Mr. Rich Jesse. I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in. Back at it tomorrow. Until then, God bless. The most original Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. On Mother Angelica Answering the Call, Father 